What is our aim? I answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all cost. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Welcome back to the Reign of Books podcast, episode number 13. We are wrapping up the fall of Hyperion, and the first part in the Hyperion Contos, which really is its own story, you are listening to the Reign of Books podcast, the reader's entry into great narratives, where the written page reigns supreme. This is a fantastic book, and everyone look, I spent a bunch of money on this new headset. Everyone notice, right here. Looking like a force lieutenant in one of the spaceships or whatever. But Josh, today's show is brought to you by Triple F Insurance. Previously known as Double F Insurance, there's been a new addition. Insurance plans are now offered for Fire, Flood, and now Farcaster. (laughs) Josh, are you concerned that your loved one may be cut right in half by a failing Farcaster? Don't waste another minute. Fatline one of our representatives today and ensure peace of mind for your loved ones. Don't get caught holding half the bag or half a spouse. Fire, flood, and now Farcaster for life. And remember, Triple F cares. Disclaimer, no we don't. And we are excited to have Triple F Insurance as our sponsor for today's show. And boy, we go through the sponsors. Josh, how you doing tonight? Hey, John, you sound great, man. I'm doing awesome. We got through the last third part three of the Fall of Hyperion, and my mind was literally blown. My eyes literally almost popped out of my head when the big reveal, all five, six, seven, eight of the big reveals came came in this last part to wrap up our pilgrim's journey. But I'm doing good. Before we get to that, before we uh, get to the end, because the end is nigh, and, and Hyperion will never be the same, let's jump into the news. Uh, the first news story, John, you go with you go with it because it's quite apt for Hyperion. It's about feeling too dumb for some books. That's right. Which books make you feel stupid? Hey, I've got one, and I'll admit it to you in a minute. But the article, it covers people who they pick up a book, and everyone else loves this book. Everyone's go- All their friends are going on about what a great book it is. But they pick it up, and either they don't really get it, maybe maybe they can't, they can't really get it, get into the language of the book, or maybe they just don't like the story, and it makes them feel stupid, and they're kind of afraid to admit it. And and if you read the article, um, it, it talks, it lists a few different books, um, and at, at the end of it, it just basically says, hey, it's okay, uh, you're smart enough to know that you don't like it, so that's good. Um, and uh, I don't really buy that, because uh, sometimes maybe you just need to suck it up or get a little smarter and uh, I'd like to admit a book that I just can't seem to get through I really want to get through it I like the book but Neil Stevenson's Quicksilver the Baroque Cycle series the language in that series is so rich I feel like I'm trudging through it but in the back of my head I know that my brain is just not able to process everything that's being said fast enough for it to be a smooth read so really, the book is kind of it's not above my head, but I have to rise to the occasion. Josh, what <laughs> what book do you need to admit to everyone that you uh, you're not smart enough for? I'll pretty much classify that the, the language, the I don't know what century language it, it is for Shakespeare gets me every time. I mean, Shakespeare is classic, but it's kind of like the uh, the they need to update every book for me so I can just you know not have to focus on what does that the thou or thine mean? Who are they referring to? So that's kind of a, kind of a high barrier to entry on Shakespeare. But I actually did try to do Don Quixote recently. Don Quixote, I'm not sure uh, if uh, if anybody's read that um, on audiobooks, but it's just kind of like, wait a minute, I need to go at my own pace. It's just it's just the audiobook was a fail for me. And Don Quixote, they said it's re- very humorous, whatever century you're in. So maybe one day I will get back to that. Um, the other story, John, is about a – it's actually just a book publishing website where people put book covers up to their up to themselves to kind of make it look like they're part of the book cover. It's really kind of cool. Um, some of it's a little risque. Some of it's just funny. Some of it's creepy. So it's not really a news story, but it's just a lighthearted thing where if you think you can have the best book cover symbiosis with your own body, then give it a try. So my favorite, I will show – the audience, for all our video listeners, shared this screen. 
This isn't really my favorite. This is the one at the top of the list, so I'm not sure if it's really appropriate to show. That guy's not appropriate. No. <laughs> and then this guy, kind of in the same league, not a eh, not risque. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's that Law and Order guy, and that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Looks like the dude's actually standing behind the book cover, and that's me, right there. That's <laughs> the one I would do. That's the creepy one. That looks totally real. Photoshopped, I bet you. So anyway, uh, we're not going to actually give away prizes for this competition, but um, go to the show notes you, uh, if, you're, if you're actually interested in seeing this and listening to the audio. Go to the show notes, and you can actually see that. So we're going to get the news out of the way. We're going to stop the news and say goodbye, news. You know why? Because we have a big show tonight. A so, John, where, where do we leave the world? Where do we leave the universe last week? We had declared war. Uh, war is breaking out, and it's with the swarms. We have... The swarms that are attacking the hegemony, which was impossible, uh, according to the military intelligence that was flawed, and we pretty much have uh, the end of civilization as we know it. So it's pretty intense stuff. And where we pick up is basically where Gladstone she tells she she tells Severn. Well, actually, let, let's let's actually before we jump into the story, where this is the end of Hi fall of Hyperion. So I don't want to just pick up where we left off. This is a huge spoiler cast. If you haven't read the book, don't even listen to this. You know, our all of our our reading threads and our forms are spoiler free. We're going to label them when we get to spoilers. But this this podcast is just our our feelings, our heartfelt emotions on what we consider after finishing this book, basically one of the best science fiction reads and one of the best stories I have ever read. Same um, here, absolutely. Case. Yeah, I mean, two yes. thumbs up, right? Or four thumbs up in case of the Shrike. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that mean son of a gun, that pretty much, you know, is he's, he's like the Terminator. So we'll, we'll get to the big eye-popping reveal about what the Shrike is. But this book ends, and, and we lead these characters. So throughout this whole book, you know, Dan Simmons takes us through it. He held my hand. You know, we talked about books that were too smart. There was a lot of complexities and agendas and, you know, basically – the, the techno core and the ousters and the hegemony, what were the driving motives of each of these factions? How did the Shrike play into that? And all of it was revealed. This thing was very, very ambitious, John, and I was very concerned that Dan Simmons couldn't wrap it up, couldn't wrap it up, couldn't explain what was going on. But surprise, surprise, he not only didn't rush through it, he actually added so many layers of complexity and talked about potential futures, you know, there wasn't one future, and how, you know, the different, different, uh, the Shrike and everybody else played in that Monita, and how the Pilgrims actually factored into that, um, to a degree, you know, the, the, uh, the he, he couldn't explain everything, what, what's that, what's that story mechanism where you kind of have to just go with it, go with the flow? Oh, the suspension of disbelief. Suspension of disbelief. Is that what you're talking the about? Well, I mean, which we the, had to do in the first place for this whole thing, but the, it, he takes it to a new level. I was I was referring to the Deus ex machina, as you no. as you pronounced <laughs> it to me. How some of the things just came into view, and you're like, what? But you can't, you know, you can't sit here and, and worry about future technology and whatnot. So we will we will kind of uh, parse out. Okay, what did this mean? What did all these different parts of the conclusion mean? Because there's a lot of parts to actually explain. So, but we will jump into the war in one of those one of those very important parts. It's basically where we don't know that Mina Gladstone, the president of the hegemony, we don't know where she's getting all of her information. We don't know exactly what her total motives are, except for she doesn't trust the Technocore. But her and Severn, our favorite cybrid, um, basically she talks about there's two there's two possibilities, and one is total annihilation. total annihilation. Which is slavery, the end of mankind. You know that you know if they're enslaved forever. The other is chaos and war and anarchy. But at least there's some slim hope. Well, it was it was it was uncertainty. And I need to take back something I said in the previous podcast that you know why can't she just be true blue? She she was true blue. I mean if if she was faced with these two choices, which for some reason, and I want to talk about this later too. For some reason, the techno core divulged to her. There's two paths you can take. Right. Um, it, it seemed by them doing that and even allowing her a chance to uh, take the other path of uncertainty, it was part of their undoing uh, in this story. 
Um, so I I'm, I'm never really was sure why. Uh, well, I, I have a couple of guesses that I want to get to later, but yeah, it was it was uh, a path of complete, right complete uncertainty. Well, some of the some of the stables in the Techno Core wanted the humans to survive. They they wanted to coexist peacefully, is my guess. But otherwise, there's no point in telling her because they were on a path to enslave us. Well, that's where Dan Simmons gets really fancy using a lot of. Uh, uh, Keats's poetry, John Keats, the 19th century poet, using the poetry to explain the motives. The stables basically didn't want to die. They they were more human than you know than they let on. Basically, they didn't want to die, so they essentially um, the three factions had their different agendas, and they essentially wanted to survive. And they were they. But yeah, we can't get ahead. We can't reveal the eye popping revelation. No, but it. but I do need to jump in since you mentioned the three factions. And uh, anyone listening to this, I, please, I hope you've read the book already. If you haven't, just keep in mind that Dan Simmons was able to add so many layers of complexity because the Technocore, the the fiend in the story, the the you know the the, the driving <laughs> force behind everything. There were three different factions, and each one had its own agenda. And there were lines crisscrossing everywhere as they were bumping into each other, tripping over each other, each trying to manipulate the other. Oh, and by the way, that's also going on inside the hegemony as well. That's and right. It that's was, what makes it, it feel was a so lot real. of yes, it was a lot of fun trying to make sense of everything happening. Keep that in mind. The Technocore isn't just the Technocore. The Technocore is multifaceted, as uh, Dan Simmons like to use that word. Yeah, and it keeps it real. It makes you realize that these are artificial intelligences. They're not just robots that take orders anymore. They they've evolved into something else, uh, and they're they're all seeking their own their own future paths. So basically, uh, Severn and Glad and Gladstones uh, separate, go their separate ways. And this is uh, you know knowing the end of the story. I loved I love actually going back over and, and seeing how Dan Simmons was trying to tell us something about humanity in each of these sections. So basically, Gladstone, at the beginning of the podcast, that quote was uh, Gladstone's speech to the World Wide Web. She talked about the coming invasion. She basically said, we're going to fight. We're going to fight instead of become slaves to these ousters. How did the ousters get here? We don't know. But they, uh, after um, Brescia, we know that they will annihilate the web. And so it's kind of cool to see how they reacted, and you saw that through Severn's eyes. And basically, it looked like everybody, everybody was listening. Right. It will be you, you thought it was gonna you thought it was gonna be everybody holding hands in a show of unity, and actually, you know, coming in this face of uh, of disaster because two thirds of the fleet had gone to Hyperion to fight, so they were down um, with military numbers. But then, after the speech was over and uh, Severn was was walking around, you started to see people start to panic because they realized, you know. So, you know, self-preservation, and they were all trying to get through the forecaster portals, and then there were riots, and uh, basically, yeah, there, there was, there was a, uh, there was no, no, no way out of it because people knew that, you know, without the fleet there to protect them, and the the first wave of attacks was right upon them. There was first wave attacks, second wave attacks. Uh, there was, there's really no way out. So, and, and it's worth noting that the Shrike cult seemed to be behind a lot of the violent protests that were sparked. I mean, not that the people wouldn't have done it on their own, but the book made note that it seemed like the Shrike cult leaders or the Church of the Final Atonement leadership or acolytes or whatever they were, whatever, whatever you want to call them, were inciting a lot of these riots. And I think this is a little bit of foreshadowing, too. We're not going to reveal thing out reveal anything out of order because it's important to see how Simmons plays on your expectations. Like, oh, humanity, you know, the hegemony's strong. We've it's not the Federation. Not everybody's hunky dory happy, uh, but basically, there's still everybody's willing to fight for a single cause. But then it's foreshadowing because you see that the the Maui Covenant um, separatists back in the first Hyperion, uh, they basically they started their revolution again. They were like, you know what? Forget this. We we never want to be a part of the hegemony. So you see humanity and all the different agendas still kind of um, come up. And it's you're right. There's there's not that. One kumbaya moment. So it's a uh, it's a lot of things that me and a Gladstone is actually fighting political uh, fallout and uh, preparing for the actual war and figuring out how they're gonna save the first wave worlds. And then we uh, jumped up back to Hyperion. You know, our poor friend Martin Salinas is on the thorn, the tree of thorns, and the tree of thorns is very real. And he he's a uh, He's he's basically up there with Sad King Billy. So you find out he's he's not gone. Martin Slinus makes his grand reappearance, but he's in agonizing pain. 
And we will find out later again why the tree has a purpose. It's not just this, uh, you know, graphic kind of um, thing that the, the strike uh, strikes fear into people with. It's it serves a purpose, and we'll find that out later. Yeah, it, it, it serves one of the largest purposes in the entire book about what does. the book ultimately is about. Hey, I got a comment real quick though. Uh, the writing about the pain that Martin Silenus was in that made me cringe, and <laughs> I I mean that because. I have been in enough pain before where um, you, your eyes can't, I mean, you just, you're seeing black, you know, you're trying to look, but it's just so much pain, you're just, you're just kind of overcome with this blackness, um, be that from a broken bone, or, I mean, you, you could name it, a lot of people have probably been in that much pain, and he, Dan Simmons wrote that in a way that I connected immediately. The, the, the descriptions of what Silenus was going through were perfect uh, for that, that level of pain. And, of course, that would be much higher than anything I've experienced, having a spike uh, right through my <laughs> right, right through now. abdomen. That was amazing, that, that description. And I was right there with him, and I, was, I felt like I was feeling the pain with him. And, and then now I'm rooting for him to, to, you know, hey, shout your poetry out loud because, you know, you just think that's going to help him deal with it and then Billy right. Billy looks down he's like more say more and uh, it was a really big moment in the book I was oh gosh this guy's hurting and I felt it and, it and it adds to the mystery you're like what is going on people from I mean millions have tried to fight the Shrike so the Shrike you, you're at this point cons I'm concerned at least at this point being like what's going on this is kind of going off the rails he's still alive with people from you know, thousands of er eras yeah, of you, human history. So you're like, okay, come on, big pals. So, fast, yeah. So, but at least, at least we're we're seeing that the pilgrims are still around. None of the pilgrims, for the record, have died except except Het Mustine, the tree ship captain. Um, he didn't fulfill his mission. Um, so next year, next next year, <laughs> this yeah. there's a lot of time debt in this book too. You, the forecasters are the saving grace for a lot of things here. But basically, we so we finally get to it, John. We keep on teasing, but Bron Lamia, she was disconnected from her body. She's still um, unconscious, and she links up with Johnny, and they go to the Mega Sphere. The Mega Sphere is you know the data sphere on on steroids. This is truly where the uh, artificial intelligences live, which again is the mystery. Where do they live? And they travel through what really intimidates the heck out of Braun. She's like an ant in this giant rainforest. They, a beautiful language. Dan Simmons really wants to make you jump into this book because he, he will not stop describing the scenery, which makes you feel like you're there. So you never kind of want to breeze through the book. And I loved the megasphere because it's just this giant ecology of every artificial intelligence with its own purpose. You have predator artificial intelligences. You have you know little worker bees. You have ecosystems, rainforests, they're, they're all, you know, they're all doing their own job, so it's like they've really flourished, and you kind of see this, and Bron Lamia is petrified, and hey, so they did, kind of, did you find yourself slightly underwhelmed by the descriptions only because, eh, yeah, I've seen that in this movie, or, oh, yeah, I saw that before in that movie, you know what I mean? It's like, you, you, you've kind of seen it, and it wasn't, if I had read this in 1995, or, yeah, 95, it probably would have just Im extremely impressed me. I can't think of the right word to say, but because I've seen movies like The Matrix and all these other things where you've got this this uh, this um, um, city that's been built out of code or whatever, uh, f you know, fill in the blank. It wasn't as impressive as I think it should have been. Yeah, you're desensitized, man. Yes. I, uh, no, I did. I did borrow a lot from The Matrix. No, you, you're right. People have visualized this for us, and so you know it could be translated to this, you know, to the screen. And you're like, ooh, it'll be exciting to see what. A visionary does with this world, which I think is there's you know, more to this one. But I don't know. I, I can't. I won't give Dan Simmons credit because I don't know. You know where, where the history of science fiction, the evolution of you know these different concepts. But he he to me, I was underwhelmed. He brought it beautifully life to me, and I and <laughs> then the next part that all gets stripped away because they reach their destination. And it's the, 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 you know, again, these tidbits that are dropped along the way, Johnny's saying we're going to visit someone. Someone, and Braun's like, who? Question mark, question mark. He's like, my father. And you're like, what? So you're kind of going to get to find out who Johnny's creator is. That the whole, the whole uh, what's the program he's part of? It's the reenactment or the, uh, 
I, don't know, re I forget, the revitalization project, um, being, bringing these old uh, earth personas back to life. They're enveloped by this huge black bubble, and they sit in the palm of this giant, uh, you know, Easter Island rock, you know, some giant uh, <laughs> rock-looking um, deity, one of the, you know, he's not a deity, but he's he's one of the big timers, the old timers, and his name is Uman, Uman, like Uma Thurman, just with an N on the end. So Uman is laughing and speaking in nonsensical riddles, and it's very funny because it's kind of like... Conan you know, the Barbarian. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. Conan the Barbarian. The, the way he was talking, it just felt like Conan the Barbarian. Which we will get there. That's the next book. But, uh, okay, we spoiled that. That's what's coming up next. So, no, this guy's funny because you think about it. People's conceptions of what it would be like to talk to, to a computer, and, and every and we talked about who's made up concepts of like a Matrix-like world for robots. Where did that come from? So you have to be different and unique. And for me, it just he pulled it off, and it was funny to listen to Uman talk. And the real funny thing was how Uman was, yeah, talking in nonsensical riddles. But then he says, oh, I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'll tell you everything. I'll tell you about the Shrike, about the artificial, the ultimate intelligence. And Braun, Lamy, and Johnny are just like at the same time like, yes. He's like, you want to know? And, and so this is where my eyes fell out of my head because – we yeah. find out and know in certain terms, you know, because Uman just spills it. He says the ultimate intelligence was realized. The machine ultimate intelligence, their god, was realized. But that was eons in the future, a time that we can't even fathom. Yeah, a, a time when yellow suns turn red and we're eating their own children is the way he described it. <clears throat> and it was amazing. You're eons. like, holy cow. And so they have their god. What does that mean? It means... And, there's, and, and, and I don't know if this is revealed right now, but, you know, th this whole kind of, like, this is this is the big, you know, Oz, you know, behind the curtains. It's like, here's the Wizard of Oz. But the Shrike is a, was created by Ultimate Intelligence because in the future, the first thing that the, the guy, the uh, machine artificial intelligence or Ultimate S Intelligence sends, said, sends back in time because yeah. he can now move through time. So he sends this message back in time. To the Technocore that we know now. And the message to them is, there is another. So there is another ultimate intelligence. There is another God. It is a human-created God. And the, and basically the ultimate, intel, you know, the artificial intelligence, the Technocore at this time, they're kind of embarrassed because that's the first message. It was kind of funny. There's a lot of humor played into this. There's a whole conversation. But he says there's already one here. Oh, well. So it's kind of like proof that there's God, right? So... Yeah, you know, this book is really funny. It plays on, you know, you know, it shows you the perspective of the atheist, perspective of religious people. It shows you a lot of perspectives. Didn't that make you excited, though? We've been going on about religion the whole time. Like, there's got to be something about religion because he keeps yes. bringing it up. And finally, they've discovered the real, the one true God, supposedly, right? And that's that, the crux. I, I got real excited, yeah. That's the crux of the story because, so here, but, and it keeps going. It's not like this big reveal. And it's like, okay, that's it. It's like there's a war. The the robot god, we'll just call them robots, artificial AI, we can say AI god. They're basically, he's he, he doesn't like this this other god being there because he doesn't subscribe to his same idea of order, whatever that is, you know, clean, you know, code ones and zeros, I don't know. But, so, well, hand, handcrafted, right? The, the UI god was the AI god, rather, um... Uh, Technocore God was handcrafted, built, streamlined, made efficient, you know, through all this code and ultimately realizing everything about the universe and the human God, we call it the human God, which was, he said it was born from the human consciousness, right? It's not, right. That, we, it's not that we actually developed it millennia into the future. It, it came, it just came, right? He said it was a, co he said our God was a cosmic accident. He said it was this just amorphous blob that had no particular efficient streamlined shape to it. And it, it just, it irritated them. Everything about <laughs> it irritated them because they had to work hard to build theirs. And this one just was. And it really <laughs> so made it they do? And what do they do? They say, we're going to war. So basically, Absolutely. It, you, two gods fighting each other, and you, the whole the whole Greek mythology between the Titans and the usurpers in the whole Hyperion Cantos that Martin Salinas is writing, it's really cool to kind of sit here and figure out, okay, who's what player is 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 battling what player, and they're both equally powerful gods. So can one really lose? What ends up happening in Uman's oh so funny dialogue is he says, "Your god didn't have the belly for it," and 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 there's a trinity to the god, just like you know in in Christian in Christianity. 
but their their trinity one's made up of empathy. I, the other two parts, I think it's intellect, empathy, and the yeah, void that binds. It's intelligence. It. Yeah, you got it. And and the empathy comes back through time, which they can do easily. So basically, what the crux of the what the Shrike is is this thing that was created by the the ultimate intelligence, the robot ultimate intelligence, to actually seek out, bring the empathy part of the human god back to the future to fight. And that's it in a nutshell. There's no, I mean, there's right. a whole bunch going on here. And yeah, the, the, the human god refused to continue fighting with the Technocore god once empathy fled back through time. Yes. Right, so and they, had, and they, they couldn't continue their war unless empathy came back. And we can go ahead and say that the purpose of the, the Shrike's a Tree of Thorns is to, um, because everybody's suffering, empathy. You basically feel people's pain. You can relate to it. They thought that'd be a ploy to, to make all these people suffer over all these eons and never die. It'd be, it'd be a ploy to get this, this guy to sit here and end that suffering and somehow draw him there, lure him it out. Like, it was like a massive antenna that broadcast suffering throughout the whole universe that empathy would be drawn towards. So, so, so I think, you know, this is, this is kind of intense. You're kind of like, whoa. Basically, you have this way distant future where two gods are warring. So the whole gods is not just an allegory or a, you know, in a, in a kind of a, an analogy. It was just, it was a real thing. You have two real gods fighting, and it's playing out in our time. Why is it playing it out out in our time? Because the robot UI, um, ultimate intelligence, is feeding information to the Technocore, and they're so they have an idea of how to actually beat humankind because of the three factions in the Technocore. One faction wants us totally dead. The other one will use us if they can to get to the their UI to to build their god. And the stables, they just want to survive, which is where crystal clear it comes. They we know their motive. They're feeding Gladstone information, what she needs to know to maybe bring Hyperion into the variable, and to start a war that will uh, you know mix things up in the in their own technocore because they want to survive. They don't want the ultimate intelligence to usurp them and basically eat them, which is what will happen. The ultimate intelligence won't need them with its grand computational power. So this is kind of the big over, overarching goal. So now we can move forward and say, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we beat the god? How do we beat the shrike that's invincible, seemingly? Because, you know, we, basically we didn't mention in the last podcast, but we have our friend Colonel Kassad going after it. But now we know that Kassad's up against insurmountable odds. So he's yeah, yeah. In the in the last one we left off, Kassad and Moneta had actually gone into some kind of portal that took them full, way, way, way into the future. And Kassad saw the Shrike, and Moneta had made the statement that if you can defeat it in combat, it will it will stop uh, what it's doing. And of course, you're going, well, what is it doing? And <laughs> and so the last thing you see of Kassad is he's he's moving toward the Shrike. He's going to attack, and the Shrike is is getting ready. And I, I'd like to point out too, at this part in the book with Uman, this is a, a story device that you see in a lot of movies, but they put it at the end. Because the writers did a terrible job and they wasted all this time with cool stuff in the movie and then at the very end they go, oh yeah, we got to wrap this up and explain everything real fast. Blah, blah, blah. And so they have something, something <laughs> like Uman. Like <laughs> exactly. Something like Uman <laughs> that just suddenly explains everything. Ah, end of movie. Well, not so in this case, right? We complimented Simmons already on how well he paced out the book, and he put this perfectly, not right in the middle, but you know, maybe in that last third of the book, and, and we didn't get it rushed all the end, so I had time to digest this and then apply it to the story as it finished playing out. Great pacing, great, great use of that particular storytelling device. I just wanted to throw that out. No, it makes me reel. For the rest of the book, it, I was reeling. I was like, okay, when is Gladstone, Gladstone going to find this out? I was so worried that she made the wrong decision because you know now yeah. you have these big, these big kind of uh, suspicious, sneaking feelings that things aren't as they seem on the war front. So we jump back. Uh, basically, and, and Severna is dreaming all this. So it's kind of like, you know, this, this story is so good because the characters all – kind of intertwined. Severn's dreaming all this, and that's how information gets passed around hey, back you, to the... You should, uh, you should go ahead and mention, too, and and I'm kind of prompting you to more about Severn. How is he dreaming all these things when he... Gladstone told well, him... No, 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 no. I mean, he's dreaming He's dreaming things outside of Braun Lamia, and the book explains that, right? Well, it kind of does, but it doesn't. 
I don't remember the the data well, sphere. He's, some, he's someone says something to him. They're like, "You realize you're dreaming things that aren't coming directly from the Keats persona embedded in Bron Lamia's head." And he's yeah. like, "Oh yeah, I am. How am I doing that?" Because he was dreaming about Kassad fighting the Shrike in the future, and you start to get this idea that this Keats persona is is a lot more than I well than at least for me than I thought he was going to be in the first place. He is now he is now. Um, I don't want to use the word omniscient, but that's kind of where it's headed. Like he I was about to say, does, yeah. does he does he do his power surpass the Technocore? And you know the whole the whole thing about the empathy part of this Trinity of this of the human God, and it's and it's real direct correlation to Christianity. It's like can he can he sit here and you know I guess embrace the universe and kind of understand it without any technology so that you know again just like life not everything is answered but he does have more powers than Technicore because he's not using the dad sphere he, he lives in the dad sphere when he doesn't have a body and he can do what they can do but he can live outside of it to a degree through people's minds because he ends up you know being part of the equation and we'll, and we'll get there but yeah it's, it's hard to explain. If you have more of an insight, I just don't know for sure at this point. I didn't really have insight, and there's another meeting with Uman later on that will explain a little bit more about about him being able to do things out, out outside of the outside of the data sphere. Um, but I, I I thought Dan Simmons had thrown that. He, you never really got a real answer on how he could do that. But the whole time, I I'm guessing. Oh, uh, is he important because? Because um, you know he's going to be the one that's going to save everyone, or you know what does this mean? What's going to happen later on? I actually thought it was genius because it kept me guessing as to what his importance was. And even though you'll find out later on, his importance was completely different than than what I was thinking at that point in time. But it was it was just, it was kind of cool that you didn't really know until Dan Simmons was ready to tell you. That's he's what I'm trying to say. He's just a good poet. He's right. just a really good poet. But we uh, we find out in the next part of the book. Yeah, we have. I can't remember the chronology. There's so many. This book isn't uh, cut into different people's narratives. So there's a lot of jumping around. But basically, uh, Keats ends back up on P Passim or Peckham, the the Catholic Church planet, and this is where he he finds out. You find out what happens to Paul Dure. Paul Dure disappeared in one of the time tombs when he went wandering off by himself, and he he's talking to Monsignor Edward. His best buddy. So for me, big emotional payoff because Dure never thought he would see Edward again. In the in the beginning of Hyperion was basically about, you know, I'm sorry that I tried to falsify information and that, you know, in the last days of the church I failed. Uh, so basically this this thing for me, again, characters and their relationships, that's what this book is ultimately all about. Even with the big ambitious ideas that get wrapped up, um, you feel for these people as real human beings. And Keats comes across them in um, the Sistine Chapel, which was taken apart and rebuilt on Pakim after the big mistake. And so it's like, you know, the Catholic Church survived and is thriving on this one planet. They're like, whoa. And basically, uh, Dure, when he disappeared, he went under to the labyrinth. He went, he went down to the labyrinth, not of his own will. He, he wanted to get out of the, ca the caves, um, but he got trapped in there, and he didn't want to even – you give one inch to the shrike because he knew he was being prodded to go to the labyrinths again. But this is where it got kind of scary because he went to a virtual holocaust. He walked all the way down and he saw these things that are normally empty, surgically built caves that are perfectly smooth and they, they're a big mystery. But they're packed with all these corpses and they're corpses again from different ages, different eras, and they're all you know kind of like this, this is I don't know how to describe it. They're, they're, they're not rotting from bacteria, but they're just dried out and just over time just falling to pieces. It very, doesn't. very uh, bad place to be. And Dure oh, yeah. the only place he can be. And he walks and he walks. It's kind of like in, uh, in the actual – I never thought about this, John, until we just started talking about it. But in Pilgrim's Progress, when Christian, the main character, has to go through the Valley of the Shadow of Death, he has to go on a narrow path. On one side is a swamp, on the other side is a, is a bottomless abyss. So th this private might not be something Dan Simmons made intentional, but he's basically on this narrow path. He can't go anywhere else. He has to go forward through this virtual, ho this literal Holocaust, and he's he's exhausted. He's like, just be done with it. You know, he the, he he doesn't know where this will end. And he's walking for hours through this. So this is his own personal hell, basically. Um, and the Shrike finally does appear, 
And the Shrike does something improbable. I mean, I just never know what this guy's going to do when he shows up. And he goes up to Dura. You think he's going to you know, pull a number on him like he did on Lenar Hoyt. But he actually extracts one of the cruciforms. So one of them is gone. And that, and that literally, that doesn't symbolize this. You know, uh, Dure knows right then and there, if he dies, he will die the true death. So, the, so I don't think it's ever explained why the cruciform is taken out of him. Well, I, I thought it was because <clears throat> there was that lore uh, about pilgrimages to see the Shrike that the Shrike may choose to grant your wish. And that would have been one of Dore's wishes that, I mean, I assume that, hey, take this thing off of me. I don't want this thing on me. Um, just like Father Hoyt when he met the Shrike and the Shrike killed him. And you, you kept wondering, why did the Shrike kill him? And then, I don't remember who it was that said it. It may have been Gladstone. Someone, when that report came back, they said, you know, um, Father Hoyt's wish was to die. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily just to have the 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 uh, the cruciform removed. But I know I know one of DeRay's wishes was to have it removed. So yeah, but the Shrike doesn't grant wishes. We, that was that was well, but, the lore. But, that, that, was but that was part of the lore. That, that was, was Shrike part of the cult, lore. Cult stuff. No, but it is a mystery. But basically, otherwise Shrike, I can't explain it. We can't explain it. It's, it is interesting, but. Hey, that's what time travel does to you. But the Shrike pulls Dore. He grabs onto him. He pulls him through, um, and he gets him through a couple of farcasters, and he lands on Pekim. And so Dore is there. That's where his story comes to the present. And Severn is like, so basically Dore tells him this. He's like, what does it mean, Severn? Because Severn kind of, you know, has has the inside scoop on uh, basically everything now. He knows he knows about the ultimate intelligence and everything. So we decide that we have to go tell. Uh, Gladstone, she's got to understand the labyrinths are a bad idea. Bad idea. You can't because in the war with the Alsters, they're trying to the AI or the um, AI liaison uh, in the technical core saying, "Hey, we have I'll these labyrinths. It. Let's put them in the basement labyrinths and then radiate the whole worlds. When the Alsters invade, it'll right, kill the Alsters." Yeah, he's saying e evacuate all the people from these worlds the Alsters are attacking. And she's saying, well, where do we put them? There's millions of them. He says, hey, what about the labyrinthian worlds? You could put them in the labyrinths and just kind of try to hold them there until we can fight off the Alster invasion and then take them back. And, of course, this is all a setup, right? This I mean, is setup. Of course, trying to force them. the dots right now, man. This is, this is where you know for sure that, no, nah, uh, uh, don't listen to that no core. I mean, run in the other direction from whatever they say. No joke. And it's, it's really hilarious because they, they put together these hologram senators or liaisons that are exactly the type of people that you would like. They're really personable. They want to be your buddy. And so that makes it a lot harder to ignore their good advice, especially when Im destruction is imminent. So there's all these, these this perfect this perfect storm uh, ra rising, and you're afraid that you know the hegemony government's going to make the wrong decision. When you know the pilgrims and all these pieces that they are putting together are, are actually putting the real puzzle in place, and you're like, holy cow. So they take off. Hunt, which is Glasgow's uh, number one aide, he takes off to uh, talk to Gladstone, and Dure takes off to God's Grove to talk to the uh, true voice of the tree. And when Dure gets there to the true voice of the tree, he says, hey, we need to find, we, we need you to understand that uh, we want to know what Hetmanstein's mission was. We don't know what his piece in this whole game was. And they don't, he doesn't get any real answers. Uh, he also happens, happens to meet up with the Shrike Bishop there. So basically the Shrike Bishop loses his temper um, because basically, you know, uh, I think Dure hints that you know the Shrike has been manipulating you this whole time, but he, he doesn't believe it. Just, it. It just, I think, is a part of the book that shows you how zealots work, how zealots, you know, will not listen to reason, uh, even when you know you get some facts, some hard evidence. But then Dure is not allowed to leave. So you're, <laughs> the God's Grove says, listen, we made a deal with the Alsters; they will not destroy God's Grove. So you must stay and witness this, and you can go tell Gladstone that you know the Alsters. You know what? There, there's a new, there's something new coming, and you still are, you're still like, whoa, what's going on here with God's Grove? They've been in cahoots with the Shrike Church and with the Alsters, and you're like, I mean, well, there's, there's two things we need to talk about here, though. One of those is before, right before he he uh, far casts over to see the the true the true voice of the whole Muir, right? Uh, the um, 
the the Templars. They have this really good conversation. This is DeRay Edward Edward and uh, um, Severn, right? They had this great conversation about everything Severn knows, <clears throat> what he dreamed about Uman talking to Keats and, and Braun Lamia. And one of those is that the true human god, the triune god, is is evolving. He's evolving with us, right? And and um, and DeRay says, this is not the true god, then. This might be an ultimate intelligence, but this is not the god of, of Abraham. It can't be. And so you've got this new debate that you're, or this new... Um, thought that you're mulling over in your head, or you should have been at this point in the book, about, well, is it just another UI, or did the Technocore actually discover the true God? In my, in my opinion of this the whole time was that this is the human's true God, okay? Um, it's, not, it's not just, it, this is the God of Abraham, and I, I have a couple points I want to make there. One, um, the, whole, the whole time in this book, everything you see about UIs and gods is going to come from the Technocore's perspective. You do not see anything in this book from the human triune god's perspective. Therefore, you don't really know the motives of that god, other than it doesn't want to be at war with the Technocore god. Okay, So anything that's happening that seems kind of miraculous or seems kind of... Um, maybe like something you can't explain real well that worked out in the human's favor, just remember that also is an ultimate intelligence that can move through time, has its own plan for humans, and can manipulate its own things in the universe. And it's countering the Technocore God the whole time. You keep, keep that in mind, because everything you see is from the Technocore's perspective. Um, but um, they, they talked about uh, the empathy part, having doubts about the war and fleeing back in time. And I'm automatically thinking about um, Jesus... Uh, is is the empathy actually Jesus, uh, right? Is that what the, is that the correlation I'm supposed to make? And DeRay's arguing that, well, our true God would not have doubts. And Edward says, um, well, you know, even Jesus had doubts. Even Jesus knew what was coming and asked for the cup to be passed from him. And maybe Jesus knew that at that time on earth he was about to go through terrible pain, but he also knew what else was coming later on because he was going to die for humanity's sins and you know humanity was going to move on and he knew there was even more coming that was going to be terrible. And so all those things were discussed and it was a real good conversation and that kind of leaves me leaves you or should have left you pondering a lot of things as you move forward in the book. The the second thing I want to talk about is when DeRay goes to um, God's is it, was it God's Grove? It was God's Grove yeah, yeah, where that's... the Templars were at. It occurred to me that the the Shrike cult, the Church of the Final Atonement, they were being fed information from the Technocore. I mean, the Shrike was built by the Technocore. The the Shrike was described as half perceived, um, half perceived, uh, uh, what was it? Extensions of the Technocore UI, right? So, so they were being fed things, and they knew, like they knew when Braun Lamia was pregnant, and they knew that Rachel was something very special, and they kicked Weintraub out in the first book, and I'm going, what do they know, and why haven't we explored the Shrike cult more? And you never actually do explore them more. But both the Templars and the Shrike cult had it all wrong. They thought that humanity had to atone for killing Old Earth, which we find out humanity... Um, did not kill Old Earth, right? Dun, dun, and, and, and dun, dun. There's more about that later. I'm not going to steal your thunder. But they think humanity has to pay for that, and they think humanity has to atone for the fact they've moved throughout the universe and, and wiped out other sentient beings, right? And that's what that's why they believe the Shrike is there. The Lord of Pain is there to make them pay for their for their evil. And that's really not what is not what's going on. The Lord of Pain is there to draw the empathy back, to continue the war far off into the future. And and both of those groups just had it so wrong. And DeRay, in this scene, is trying to argue with them, and they don't want to listen. And I'll turn it back over to you now, because I talked a lot there. You bring out some, like, deep thoughts by John Keel. Those are meant... Those I think they kind of intertwine at some points because basically humans will make out what they want to, whatever they see in the world around them. So the Shrike cult basically deified this this unexplainable mystery on Hyperion that who knows how the pilgr pilgrimages pilgr the pilgrimages got started. Take two. Basically. It's just it's just this long mythology with them, and it's kind of like they made what they wanted to see out of the world without knowing as much as you know the Technocore. Uh, basically the, the government of hegemony, they were the slaves. And so where this boils down to is we're the slaves of the Technocore, and we'll find out exactly why. 
but basically Gladstone is mistrustful of them, and they get direct information from the Techno Corps, but the Strike Church never did. So it just it's it's just more philosophical point about they, they they came up with their own meanings in these unexplainable events and places and things in the universe and they got it completely wrong and they uh I don't know, they, they they uh they made a big mistake in the end, I'll tell you that. So the the thing with uh Jesus Christ is with Severn, you know, Dure even hinted at could you be the empathy? And it's like how can I? It's like maybe the empathy doesn't consciously know um where it's drawn to or what it is. So there's there's a lot of these you know philosophical points that you you have to kind of wrap your head around and say what is, what is the true meaning of life? They're not trying to answer that question, but they are trying to say in this context of the future, we have this war going on with these two gods, and you know what? They're two totally different types of gods. So it it is from the perspective of the techno core and what drives the other god, and we'll figure that out. Uh, but basically, we we do have Duray trapped now in God's Grove right now. And Severn never gets gets to where he's going with Hunt, and this whole latter part of the book uh, deals with Severn and Hunt being trapped on Old Earth. Old Earth, we come to find out in the other conversation with Uman, was never destroyed; it was removed uh, because they couldn't see. You know, they they knew there would be a reprisal in the future. A small irony there that if Earth was really destroyed and, the, and it was found out it was deliberate, there might be a huge reprisal on the Techno Core. So they just uh, moved it, sucked it through the black hole instead of having the black hole destroy it, and they moved it to another place, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, he yeah actually he said it shuddered and shook, but it did <laughs> not die. I loved, I loved that language. And Uman, I, yeah, yeah. Another part I was about to mention, he was, he talked about you're, you're not that bright for slow, slow, slow uh, motion stillborn. creature. <laughs> he called him stillborn. He called Severn stillborn because uh, Severn actually did go in and dream and talk to Uman. This is. We forgot to mention, oops, that at the end of the last conversation with Bron Lamia, Uman actually killed J John Keats. He squashed him. He basically said, you were supposed to die because um, just like humans, we, do not, we, we usually destroy things we don't understand, which was another tongue-in-cheek reference to basically how they are like humans. So he squashed John Keats because the... Um, and the the I can't remember the name of the project. It's you know the the resurrection. Oh yeah, project. it was yeah it was the, the the persona the persona resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection project was something they just didn't understand. They couldn't account for. So the the second uh, so Severn when he actually dreams, they get stuck on old Earth. Him and his best friend Hunt, who is actually pretty pretty arrogant right. and snobby friend, toward him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a whole developing again of relationships. The book goes back to relationships and even secondary characters. They, they come to the forefront, and there's some very emotional scenes, and you're like, holy cow, how does Simmons do this? How does he make you care? Uh, but that comes later. Um, he comes back to Old Earth. Why? We think that's because he basically knows the information about the labyrinths. They're a big trap. The Technocore is saying, go to the labyrinths. We'll protect you from the ousters. And he knows that this place, because Dure, Dure told him that there was, it was a place for thousands of corpses. So no, don't go here. <laughs> bad mojo. So they get stuck on old earth and uh, when he has his conversation in his dreams with Uman, it was just funny that one part where Uman called him an idiot because it's like, you know how much energy it would take to recreate a planet yeah. down, to the, down to the Coliseum and to New York City or, or whatever famous landmarks? You're an idiot. So and and, was, then, and then, he said, then he says, we're not gods. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, tons of ironies here. Tons of ironies. But uh, he and he uh, Hunt and Severn basically go through the whole book. Actually, keeps coming back to him, and it's uh, chopped up. But he eventually is back on Old Earth to die. Um, the Techno Core is keeping them, him there, and it's not to keep him. And it wasn't to keep the truth from Gladstone. I can't remember what it was for. It was a small little point. Well, well, it actually it wasn't a small point. They a big point. Uh, You're right. Uman Uman told Severn Keats no name. I called him M whatever by the end of this, just M whatever. That's how I refer to him in my audio notes as I as I took them. But um, the Techno Core had devised him, and this was part of this whole cybrid project. They wanted to create a a an, 
a being, I guess, that would look very enticing to empathy. So even though you have the Shrike over here on Hyperion with his tree of thorns that's calling to empathy, broadcasting the pain throughout the universe, calling empathy, come here, you empathize with these with these people that are suffering on this tree. They wanted to give him a body so that the Shrike could actually nab that body and put that body on the tree of thorns and take it far into into the future to continue the war. And the Cybird was supposed to be that. And Uman tells Keats, he's like, you know what? This is your last chance. We've tried to get you to do this twice already, okay? And you keep rejecting it. And I had to sit there and ponder that for a minute. But Keats couldn't figure out what he was all about, and so he just kept aimlessly moving throughout doing whatever he was doing. But here he's finally told, you are supposed to be this this thing that we want empathy to come and and take over, and then we got him. Right, because it, it's that perfect balance between technocore and human, right? Uh, that, that's the trap. I didn't get that trap, and I'm going to say we have to find out and go to Dan Simmons because I don't. No, I didn't they, get that no, at all. Uman, Uman flat out said that. No, he, he, but, he, he but told if him. I would Uman sit here and want him to go in the body, if they knew where the empathy was, right? I don't, I don't, I don't know that it was the body necessarily as much as the actual uh, persona. Right, and they yeah. wanted him to occupy that, and I might have this all wrong. Cause there were so many things being thrown at me, but I knew there was some correlation between that persona and empathy. Take it was a trap for empathy, and I no, may have found right. it all wrong, but it was a trap. No, you convinced me because the Shrike was there at his uh, basically when he was on old Earth to to he to had, sure he had he tuberculosis. Me. Yeah, he was he was just in bad shape. Um, Hunt had to look after him. He had tuberculosis, and the Shrike showed up at the end for his funeral. So you're right. The if I had that all wrong, I'm sorry, everyone. But no, there's I'm some thinking, correlation there. No, I'm thinking that they, the Shrike knew. Yeah, one, like you said, they built the body. It's just Uman, but Uman's on the, the side of the stables. They don't want to be the ultimate intelligence to u usurp them. They, that's, that's the scary thing. They're, they're the usurpers from the future. They're just going to wipe out all the older AIs. So the stables are like, forget this. We're going to preserve ourselves. So if he was trying to manipulate the cyber project, I just uh, you did kind of convince me there for half a second that maybe the cyber was the vessel where the the strike could actually find him. And um, but who knows? I know that that wasn't what I was thinking about. You just you just took me down the rabbit hole further. Well, but that was why I had made the point earlier that there were three different factions in the Techno Core that all had their own agenda, and Uman may not have had direct control over this particular thing. Because Keats seeks out, he, he tries to get some kind of message to Gladstone through the data sphere, and he runs into Uman as you know as he falls into a dream and tries to, to get this message to Gladstone at Hunt's bidding. And he runs into Uman, and then all these questions start coming out, and then all these answers start coming out, and it was it was kind of confusing. You're right, and you know what we've we've gotten off we've gotten on a track to where all these guys off of Hyperion are, but what about people back on Hyperion? What's what's going on with them? Do we just kind of abandon them? Basically, if you remember the console, um, he was a, he was basically in bad shape. He had crash-landed in the river. Turns out that he's alive, and Gladstone on at Severn's bequest sent somebody to fetch him, and we come to another favorite character who makes a reappearance. And I don't mind all these coincidences, because it's like, yeah, bring, out, bring back the characters we like. But the console's still alive, but he gets captured by two bandits, two ruthless bandits. Basically, the war on Hyperion, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and they're pretty much going to kill him. And they're not, they are not—they don't care because they uh, get, they got all his valuables. And But when they're walking, he uh, the console has a ploy to stay alive. He tells them there's gold upriver, and they buy it. So they're walking upriver, and it's really funny because Theo Lane, uh, the, the governor general of the planet, comes to the rescue in his little skimmer. I mean, him and that skimmer must sleep together because he's always in his skimmer prancing around and Theo Lane does a sonic blast and he takes down the bandits and he rescues the console and I have to say just one little part here the sonic blast you know, paralyzes them and the console lands on the dirt and doesn't know what's going on or who saved them but this little ant comes up to his eyeball and is about to say oh look it's a nice moist eyeball you know so he's about to claim its prize and, and the, <laughs> the console is like Move me, get me out of here before this ant jumps in my eye because he can't even close his eyes. Funny little side note because it's just well written, the whole book well written, and it's like I want to jump into the story myself when little things like this come up. But the console, um, he, he shakes it off, and they're flying back, and they get shot down. And so things happen rapidly. You know, basically the ground attack on Hyperion is happening now. Um, we can't 
the 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 Alistair's are just taking over everything. And we can't hold it, hold Hyperion any longer. But the console with the uh, with the Theo Lane's help and with a couple other people's help, uh, including the reintroduction of Rachel's old doctor boyfriend, um, they they all get to the spaceport and they uh, get into uh, the console's spaceship. And that's where we find out Gladstone says, I need to ask you a favor. I need you to rendezvous with the Alsters. And you're like, holy cow, he's got to get back to his friends. He basically tells people, you know, he doesn't know what humanity is, he, but he knows he has friends and people that he's willing to live for. And that's the only reason he's living, really. It's, it's kind of going back to why we care about these characters. He, he's on a mission to save Rachel, save Braun. And so, uh, but they know that they can't get back. And basically, he, he defers reluctantly to go uh, rendezvous with the Alistairs. And he knows he's probably going to his death sentence because he, they know that they, he betrayed them. And so this whole, this whole section, you think it's the end. I mean, you really think the console has been on a slow path. You know, he has to fulfill some things, um, part of his destiny, so be it. And this is part of his destiny. I was fully prepared for the Alistairs, you know, to call, you know, close curtains on the console. But we have uh, the doctor with him, uh, Rachel's old archaeologist boyfriend, and Theo Lango with him. So you're kind of like, holy cow. Um, th this whole time, you know, things are, are coming to a head, John. I don't see anybody getting out of the story alive. I mean, th things, you know, humanity is at stake. So you know there's going to be martyrs. And, and I think the console is up next. But we'll find out. Because we still have to... Uh, what, who actually delivers the information to Gladstone that there is uh, there is a duplicity on the Technicore's part and that uh, she shouldn't listen to them with the labyrinth idea? And Gladstone finally catches on. I'm trying. It was in a dream. Severna's yeah, dream. Everything came to her. Everything came to her in a dream. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. But yeah, everything she somehow he reached out to her in a dream. And that's in the dreams is where we we take it on faith basically. Pretty much, everybody has to take it on faith. We need to we need to do a ninety degree turn in our but, strategy. But this is this is where I made the comment before that the human UI, the, the the true triune God, could have been stepping in, right? If if you want to look at it that way, and you want to say take it, it on faith, faith yeah, take it yeah. on faith. That's to me, that's exactly what was happening, right? We know what the Technocore UI was doing. We don't know what the human UI was doing, but anyway. Where do we jump ahead, though? I thought we were going down the path. Oh, no, no. The, the narrative. They, just, they just hadn't quite got there yet because um, we we didn't um, we didn't talk about yet about the con – well, we kind of talked about the conversation he had with the Ousters, um, and then we find out that uh, the Ousters tell the console, uh, we're not attacking the hegemony. What are you talking about? We're only here in Hyperion. And he's like, no, uh they're, you're all over the place, all in our world <laughs> web and stuff. And they're all like, no, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so he he that's sends that back to Gladstone. Is, he sends that back. That's to why I love the narratives coming together, though. You're right. It's basically you get confirmation. So no, they, so yeah, we have to sit here and say he does get to the Alsters. He's playing, and I love it because the Alsters are some freaky, freaky humans. Um, we haven't talked about Kassad. Kassad basically is not dead. He he goes after the Shrike. Monita saves him from near decimation. They do a cool. Very cool hand-to-hand -hand combat scene, but the Shrike is just too quick, and even even with the silver quick suit, Kassab... And this is, this is all this. in the future too. Yeah, yeah. Minetta gives him one of her one of her suits, the the cool the cool futurist, the quick silver suit. Yeah, and he almost gets his foot ripped off, and he's limping on one foot. You, you think Kassab's a goner? The Shrike even embraces him and goes for his his face. You think, okay, Kassab gave his best shot. You really think he's going to delay the inevitable, or he's going to you know he's going to Cause them to actually have some more time or something on um, that. He's a martyr. But Monita does save him, and she takes him to a future. And the reason I, I mention it at this point is she, she takes him to a future that he's like, wow, I don't want to leave because this Coolest place is beautiful. Coolest planet ever. They, Coolest they, planet they ever. They said stars. <laughs> they said everything was bright, not from a sun and it being daytime, but they were, they were at the center of the galaxy, and so many stars filled the sky that it was just... So it was just so bright. I've and got I thought that was say, the coolest description I'd ever heard of for outer space. Never heard or seen me, that before. I hate to equate it to this. It reminded me of the Lorax with the truffula trees and the bear balutes and oh, all this yeah, beautiful, crazy color from a color book. And with humans, the things that was most striking were the humans that were all stripes of humanity. We're talking an ecosystem of humans that looked like bugs and giant butterfly men 
and butterfly women. And, and it sounds bizarre, and you're like, okay, we're, we've, we've literally gone psh, way off into weirdo science fiction. But it shows you the, this future, and you're like, okay, all right, cool. They, say, they save Kassad, so I've got to like him, right? And they, they eventually have to leave, but then when the Alster is on the swarm, and Theo Lane wakes up because he was injured when they got shot down on that quick on that quick trip back on Hyperion. He wakes up and he's like, "Okay, good. We're not we're not dead. The Alsters didn't you know, like blow us up. We made it." But the the console's playing a concert on his awesome grand piano on the balcony of his ship. Gotta love the ship. And it's in and the audience is on a lawn, a very small small little asteroid. And you're like, "Oh, we're here." And they're very weird looking again. Aliens aliens with feline features and monkey you know, that, features monkey features but they're <laughs> humans they're un un unmistakably human you're like holy cow but what Dan Simmons is trying to say here is this is humanity that has evolved on its own out from under the yoke of the hegemony or the the, the technocore the technocore has enslaved the hegemony and we're and we we know this we haven't brought this fully home but it's because the Farcasters and every other piece of technology outside the Hawking Drive was supplied by the Technocore. So they are completely dependent on it. But they haven't harmed us. They've maintained their independence. They've worked with us. But the Alsters are like, no, you are their slaves, and you will find out why. And we find out they're not – the Alsters aren't attacking the Technocore. So who destroyed God's Grove? Paul Dure does survive. Because God's Grove is destroyed. I know we're jumping around here, but there's so many plot points. And so um, Heaven's Gate and God's Grove are gone, wiped out. And we're trying to get our defenses. And Gladstone sends one gung-ho commander to find out, to penetrate a swarm. And so this is where the different narratives, threads of the narrative come together, where the consul is still alive. He goes to the tribunal because you still have to answer for his betrayal. But he, but the Alistair's answers questions and say, we are not attacking the web. And you get confirmation when Gladstone awakes from her dream, and she's like, the Technocore. <laughs> it's the Technocore. Because she finds out what Severn knows. Severn planted it in her consciousness. So because the, the console independently finds out from the Alistair's, their, their own leaders, we're not attacking anywhere except here on Hyperion. She gets it in a dream from Severn, and then she gets it from her gung-ho commander on a secret transmission. Unfortunately, he goes out in a blaze of glory. I like this guy. He, uh, he, yeah. was, uh, he was a commander on the Maui Covenant Rebellion, just a cool dude. He goes in the penetration of the swarm, and they capture some, uh, some Alsters, and they're not Alsters because they burn up, they go poof, like cybers do when you try to do an autopsy. So you know unverifiably that it is the Tentacore that is trying to destroy humanity. So you're like, holy cow. And here's in Hey Josh, there's one more plot point we, we failed to mention that we have to. Another one? That's Another right. One. <clears throat> Remember Uman tells Severn, Keats, no name, M whatever, okay? He tells him where the Technocore resides. We finally find out where they actually reside because you're thinking the whole time, is there some planet where they have this massive server farm and that's where the Technocore resides? And they finally divulge, um, and, and Uman finally divulges to Severn. He said, I've told you this before. We are in the spaces in between the Farcasters. So they're actually in in those black holes, basically, those those singularities, and they're in what they call a metasphere, and that's where they reside. They're they're using they're using um, it's like cosmic computation almost. But Uman admits to Severn, he says the the space we live is in the metasphere between the Farcaster singularities, but the actual hardware, the computation is done inside human brains. Every time dun, the dun, humans, dun, dun. Every time the humans uh, tap into the data sphere, he said that, that opens up millions and billions of neurons for us to use however we want. And we're using your brains, the billions of humans in the hegemony, all of your brains are basically our hardware. And he said that is a lot, a lot, a lot of computing power. Very Matrix-like. That is exactly like the Matrix. And you know what? That's like me forgetting to tell people that Darth Vader is really <clears throat> father, you know? So if you haven't seen Star Wars, I was like, oh my goodness, the Farcasters. 
You're right, John. I hope you, you ruined that for someone. I hope you ruined Star Wars for somebody. Like you 30 can't... years later, I hope you ruined it. <laughs> you can't glaze over the forecaster part. Basically, we are so worried that the forecasters, if the Tentacore could take it away and destroy the hegemony at, at a whim, and you're worried that we go to war against them, they'll just laugh at us and kill us immediately like we're all drop dead. But no, they actually do need us because every time we use the forecasters, they live in between, you know, that's that's that black void, the medicine. Actually, it's the megasphere. Um, the metasphere is another thing. Yeah. We're just gonna they, they can't compute things without our brains tapping in, and yeah, yeah. They, can't, they, can't expand, they can't expand the web unless they have us more going, out, going out through space, establishing more colonies on other planets, and opening yeah. up more forecasters. So, so, there you go, and thanks who, for bringing who that, is that, the that leech? Who is the leech in this relationship? The technocore <laughs> or the humans? And you know what? The, what I was about to say wouldn't make sense if we didn't reveal that plot point, because Gladstone, she realizes that, you know what? The Tentacor can kill all of us, and the Volatiles are probably winning out, or even the the, ult, the Ultimates, who want to get to the Ultimate Intelligence Project and, and get that going, they're like, fine, let's, let's just go ahead and wipe out the humans and use the ones... The reason they're being nice and trying to, you know, trying to within the political structure of the hegemony, kind of talk all this out and convince us, hey, we got the death wand. Just move everybody into the labyrinth. That's and they're thinking that's, that's right. computational power that force. Massive ship you know. mounted death wand. But no, I'm, I'm, I was just saying that you know what they don't need the billions of people on the on on all the hegemony, so they're willing to do mass genocide if they can just convince us and be nice long enough to get us down into the labyrinth. And it's very creepy. Because they're, they're, they're just doing it with smiles on their faces because the, the liaisons within the Senate are all part of the Techno Corps. They're just smiling away and giving us every reason to do it. And we know we know now it's a big ploy. The console knows it thousands of light years away. And then uh, uh, Gladstone figures out in her dream and at the same time her, uh, her, her hero who goes down the blaze of glory actually gets proof. Um, because it's not a real swarm. So where do we sh where, where do we transition to? We basically find out that we have to kill, we have to defeat the Technocore. And if if they're just as vulnerable as us, this is the part of the book which really eats away at you. This is kind of the end. We've blazed. I mean, we have these huge revelations that Shrike has come back to get a, a part of our God to fight it in the future, so it can create true order in the universe. You have all these pilgrims who have different parts to play. Um, but I don't want to actually do the big reveal until we wrap up where the pilgrims end up at, because the, the book the book spans out in so many different directions. But the console survives, so we'll take it one by one. The console survives. Basically, the Alistair say, "You helped create this new chaos in the universe. We will survive. There will be, you know, people will die. A lot of people will die." <laughs> they and, said, uh, "We'll go avenge you." That we was right. Really, we can't really go and help you right now because it's too far away, and we don't use forecasters. Like we were so afraid they were going to take a forecaster and infiltrate our web. They said, "No, we that's some that's some techno core stuff. We don't do that." But we'll avenge you whenever we get back to your, you know, your hegemony system. That was a heck of an irony, wasn't it? That's a, that's a really really good point. They were like, "Oh no, these Alistairs who can rival us from a military standpoint, and these are these barbarians who will just sack our cities. I mean, they totally got the Alistairs wrong. So it's, a, it's kind of a small irony at the very end of the book. You know, you were trying to protect these forecasters in the Hyperion system during your, your kind of military, you know, limited military warfare, and guard that bad boy when they would never in, in their right mind step a foot through it. So huge irony there. And the, the, the kind of tongue-in-cheek comment, the console's not satisfied because, like, you know, we're not going to fight the Tentacore on their terms, so we're not going to go and fight them. But when everybody's dead in the hegemony, we'll start humanity over again. So the console just, he basically has feel, felt used by everybody, and he can't, he just, uh, he has to live. They're not going to sentence him to death for his betrayal. They're going to make him help rebuild society in whatever capacity he can because help cause this mess. So yeah, that was his, that was his Homer Simpson moment right there. The dump. <laughs> so. It was. It was poor, poor guy, but you know everybody could predict him. Everybody in the future can predict everything. You don't, don't even try to you know hide your motives and your long yeah. long bitter story for revenge. It's not going to work. So the console lives. Braun Lamia, hey, she comes. Bra back. Yeah, Braun Lamia, yeah, and then Kassad. We don't want to miss this. We don't want to miss this epic fight with Kassad. 
Let's take it to Kasad. Go for it. This this is the part Kassad, I will admit. I will admit, John, that I cried in this part of the book. Kasad opens up a can of whoop, but whatever you want to say there that's appropriate for a rated G podcast whoop on butt. the on the strike. Um, yeah, yeah. So so he um he was he was taking it to the strike. Okay, in this this futuristic battle. Okay, because. They end up fighting on that future plane, right? And and this this warrior came to them in the future and fights the Shrike, okay? And what happens is the Shrike, uh, it, it it looks like he's not going to be able to beat the Shrike, but Kassad he thinks and he he uses things at his disposal like his force rifle or just whatever he can. And the Shrike starts backing up a little bit and starts backing up through time, and Kassad is chasing after the Shrike through time, and they're going back in time and forward in time, and, and, and it, it. it kind of brings it, a, few more, a few more plot points together. Um, but the way it started is uh, Braun Lamy is back, and she's moving towards Weintraub uh, near the Sphinx, and the Shrike uh, comes into that point in time and starts walking towards them, and Kassad now comes in. He phases into that point in time, and, and, and I'm leaving out a lot of detail because we don't have time, but he picks up a force rival. He goes after the Shrike, he lights that thing up with some lasers. He melts the sand under the strike speed. It's sinking, and that's when they start this going back and forth in time. But ultimately, they end up, you know, Kassad was the warrior that was promised. Uh, and again, this is more, to me, the human god stepping in and, 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 and imposing its own agenda on, on the things that are going on here. But they end up on that futuristic battlefield, right? Uh, and... And there is a massive battle, and there are there are there are thousands of I guess what are ousters or humanoids that that come and they help Kassad fight these shrikes. Okay, and uh, at the end of it, the the battle's over, and clearly the ousters are the the humans the humanoids won, and they're going and they're looking through the battlefield for for Kassad, and they finally find Kassad, and they said he was in a death embrace. With with the one strike, right? The main strike, and uh, clearly he had beaten the strike, right? I mean, that's what I got from it. They never said the strike was dead, um, but he had beaten it. He had stopped it, and and I don't want to say the strike's dead because there's two more books in this Cantos that are set 247 years into the future from this story, and the strike is in those stories. So he has at least beaten the strike in combat. Don't know if it's dead or not, but they pulled his body away. And I got to tell you, and I'll turn it over to you, Josh. That was a really touching moment. And Dan Simmons didn't say a lot during that scene, but it was really, it was real. It just, it had a lot of impact when, when you read it. Kassad was trying to offer his own life. Yeah, There's a lot of repercussions for for that battle. The battle wasn't just to uh, fight, have Kassad go to the future and have the strike fight. It was basically the, the agreement was for this warrior. That I think where it all ties in is. The agreement between the two parts of the human god who are still in the future and the um, ultimate intelligence um, robot god says, if you're a single combat, if you can beat our strike in the future, then we will let you come back with us. And I guess on your own terms, you know, the, the human captor or Monita, she's the human guardian that only releases the strike when he's supposed to be released. <laughs> Basically, I, I don't get the whole meaning of... How she how she is his keeper, but she basically is given the privilege, and they are allowed to go back in time with the Shrike. She she's chosen, and I think it's because Kassad did beat the Shrike. I can I can sit here in my own mind and say that was the significance. That's why Kassad gave his life. And so you know, I'll admit, the language in the in the beginning of that chapter was Kassad died on the battlefield. So I did cry at this part. I got tears. Ugh. Yeah, it, it, it was emotional. Because I don't blame you. It was a that was a big deal. It was. It was. So it just had I a think, lot of weight. I think again, if you look at the one or two sentences, you're right. Dan Simmons was sparse in his language, but because they defeated the Shrike, then the terms were set. Fine, you can go back and hunt for the empathy part of our, our God because we need him too, and we'll fight with him. But a human of our choosing will go back with him, and you're like, oh, so I'm making connections that maybe aren't overt. I might be making connections that aren't there. But she does, she does bury Kassad, and she goes back in time with him, and so you're like, but, wow. But that that was the point. That was the point of the crystal monolith, right? 
The, uh, is it the, the crystal tomb? monolith was Kassad's tomb, and yeah. the, you know the the time tomb is being built far into the future and being sent back in time. They 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 housed the Shrike during his travel back through time, but that particular time tomb was nothing but Kassad's final resting place. And that was really cool. was awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. And so Braun actually get, catches a glimpse of Monita because she is trying to get to the th um the Tree of Thorns. And uh, she basically hears all the wailing, and she wants to rescue Salinas, and she's beating herself up because she's pregnant. And she's like, I don't want to, I don't want to help Salinas as my, you know. And she she sees Monita, and and, and basically she sees Kasad and knows his final, you know, his final resting place and what happened to him finally. You know, these guys get separated early on, but Saul is waiting for Rachel at the Sphinx. Braun is is there trying to go to save Salinas. And she does encounter the the Shrike Palace is opening along with the other tombs, and she sees Salinas, and she almost breaks her hand trying to get this umbilical cord, that same type that she was attached to. There's all these other people in the yeah, Shrike well, Palace. Yeah, he, well, he's not on a tree. He's not actually on a tree. There's like a tier. There's like these <laughs> these stone tiers that just – she. it was massive. I mean, I couldn't actually imagine how big it actually was. But what it turns out is instead of there being a tree of thorns where people are impaled but never actually dying – what it really is is they've they've plugged them into the techno core more or less. They they they've plugged them into something, and it's a it's a pain that is in their mind. So they're not actually impaled on a tree. They're not actually impaled. But all those people on the tree of thorns were, didn't appear to actually be impaled on a tree at all. And it, it, and so instead of them actually killing these humans, which I was confused about because there were so many gory moments with the Shrike of him slicing people open and guts being everywhere, but but it looks like at least there were certain humans that weren't actually killed but rather plugged in to something, and it made them feel like they were in you know, impaled on the tree, right? But you, but you saying their connection to the techno core, or maybe the future H had to have been. Um, had ultimate to have been. intelligence. I don't know if the future ultimate intelligence needs humans like it does now to power, I mean, because the techno core needs humans. We're its slaves. It, it it feeds off our neurons. So you just that could be a, a jump we're making, but it's it's an interesting jump. How that tree of pain or the tree of thorns actually helps the techno core in the future with ultimate intelligence. Keep you know keep going, but that that that's never explained. But Bron Lamia saves <laughs> saves Salinas, and he's his regular colorful yeah. self. She breaks his hand, <laughs> and then he turns around it's, and the it's Shrike followed strike. her in. Yeah, he's like, "There's a freaking Shrike behind you." <laughs> and then cut scene again. So every everybody is still is still you know kind of in dangerous way. Kassad's gone. Consul, you know, he has a reprieve. But the, everybody is still the death one could still be coming because now we know that the ten of core is completely duplicitous. The the ultimates and the volatiles have have won. They're attacking the tech. They're attacking all the humans of the hegemony, destroying worlds, and still trying to force us politically to put some people in the tunnels and be all nice about it, saying it's a great idea and we'll kill the ousters. But Mina Gladstone gets her top general convinces him what's happening based off this dream with Severn. And from the from the you know circumstantial evidence of what they found in the swarm on the last fat line transmission, and you're like, oh my goodness, we're so close. Please don't let you know Abraham Hyperion die because they did agree to let the Technocore take one of these Death Wands to actually show the swarm don't mess with us. They're going to actually detonate this Death Wand on Hyperion. That puts everyone, all our buddies, the Pilgrims, and everybody's in dangerous way. On Hyperion, you're like, holy cow, it's going to kill the Alsters, who are actually the good guys. We haven't actually explained the connection of the Alsters, but they are not slaves to the Technocore. They have evolved into these weird humanoids of all different varieties because they have embraced the ecosystems and the strangeness of the universe. So it's a huge metaphysical kind of you know philosophy or theme about how this is humanity untethered. This is humanity in its natural form when you spread out across the galaxy. And we are, we are finding the technical on our own terms, and we're going to help you what's left of the hegemony. So if you got all of that, we come to the big moment, John. I, I, I told about me and his big war speech when uh, we went to war with the ousters, air quotes. But what happens here? What decision happens real fast, and how does it all come to a head? Blow all the Farcaster spheres and destroy the whole Techno Core, or at least trap them, seal them off. Did it? No, it killed them. Did it? Did it kill them? 
I don't think it actually killed them. I think it sealed them away. And they were subject to their lions, tigers, and bears and the massive metasphere of which they were afraid to venture into. Another layer. So Johnny Kill just kind of just said it really quick. No, they blew the forecasters. Me and a Gladstone. You see, the, the we thought the Technocore... The Technocore basically did use it. Here's where it got interesting for me, John. We tried to dupe the Technocore and to bring a Hyperion into the equation. Why? Because that was our card. Basically, that was leverage we could get on them. If they're scared of Hyperion, let's bring it in to the, to the play, and let's make sure that the Technocore doesn't have complete control over us. We never had the, the idea that you know they, they equally depended on us as we did them with, with the Farcasters. But then the Technocore did us... A, a, a solid, or they, they duped us, I should say, and they made us think the whole uh, ouster swarms were invading us. So you know what that means? That means they can sit here and kill all the humans and make it think that the ousters did it, and they can eventually just wipe us out. So we our war scheme backfired on us, basically, but then in the very end, we wiped them out. We basically don't let the Death Wand be detonated on Hyperion. It's, it's lost in, in between... The forecasters. The general is a big martyr. That was a pretty emotional part where the general actually drives this Death One ship into the forecaster, and uh, then the forecasters go dead. So everybody trapped in between the forecasters and everybody who's on at work on another planet, and even generals who are trying to save the universe. Uh, everybody gets yeah. cut off. A lot of people killed. died, though. A lot of people died. People going through the forecaster at the moment they got cut off, and you get a torso yeah. that shows up here and some legs that end up over here. And, and that's only a few thousand. But the, the, the emotional resonance in this story comes down to how technology can be your greatest enemy, um, even though we let it rule our lives and we think it's our, our greatest enabler and it's, it's a solution that it um, improves humanity. But once the forecasters go dead, Dan Simmons just lays it out, how the emotional not just the economic toll, but the human, the human suffering and the human toll um, that people take because the, this interconnected hegemony of 270 worlds now are all these independent worlds with some that were, are not self-sustaining, and they have to they they go into rebellion. Some hang all the hegemony officials; others simply uh, decimate their populations. You have rogue leaders that come up, and you know, there's there's jihads on these, you know. On these worlds with Muslims and in and, and worlds with Hebrews, they you know they, they try to figure out how things how how to fix things and they do fix things because you know they have their whole kibbutz system there and so it's really cool. In Maui Covenant, they they basically enslave all the tourists that took over their world, all these off worlds that destroyed the ecosystem. Of Maui Covenant, it's kind of you know it's kind of karma. You know they make them dismantle all the oil rigs. So Dan Simmons really plays out in these huge um, huge arcs. Of the different societies and how they developed and, and, and what happened in the aftermath. So Mianna Gladstone, she's basically one of the biggest, um, you know, she created a ton of genocide because whole populations were decimated with plagues. Without this interdependency, everything is thrown in chaos and the hegemony as we know it dies. And that takes its toll on her. She essentially, uh, on uh, Taui Seti Center, she, she basically goes out to the crowd, this mob that's there to kill her, and she basically goes out and 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 she lets Dive. them. It's it's kind of it's it's not bizarre, but it's kind of very quick. It's just a very quick end to this woman who spent her whole career yep. trying to balance out keeping civilization, and humanity, and hegemony in power, thinking the Ousters were barbarians, not understanding the full the full concept of deception that the Technicore you know uh, pulled over on us, and it's 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 kind of sad. Um, and so she does. She does get a um, a nice little monument etched in the mountainside on Hyperion, dedicated to her. So that was kind of cool. Hey, Josh, but, I have to interrupt real quick, and I have to go back to one point that I have to make, and that is that if the if the Technicor had gotten us into the labyrinths, right, they would have enslaved us there, and they would shit. have they would have had us as as basically just our brains being their computing hardware. And we finally learn that the resurrection parasite, the cruciform, was developed by the Technocore. Bingo. So, so that as the humans would eventually just die of age in the labyrinths, the parasite would bring them back to life. And it didn't matter if they were just mindless and, and idiots, as long as the brain neurons were there for them to use as their computing power and to continue on to their ultimate intelligence. But because we're running out of time, kind of, sort of, 
That we was important. I can't believe I missed like important points. I I shouldn't even be talking about fall. <laughs> Dude, you're right. The no, cruciform. Josh, no, stay with me. How can we forget this? Because the cruciform was crucial. I mean, because was there was a, everything, just everything going on at the end of this book. So much happened in this book, but because the fact, again, Dan Simmons held my hand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And he basically mentioned that explicitly. My mind immediately went back to Hyperion, Paul Dure, the Bikira, and I just had a shiver. I just really shivered at this part. I'm like, oh, it's like the Matrix. You know, if you've never seen the Matrix, I won't say any more than that, but it's very much like the Matrix, Terminator, all these other futures where the robots don't care about humanity. And that was kind of a, a, a gave me goosebumps at the end. But we, uh, we see the end of Hegemony, John. Uh, and then fast forwarding to Weintraub, because we have to get to what happened to baby Rachel. The Shrike baby Rachel. took baby Rachel. This is where the, the, the but, 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 Godhead. Yeah, all this has kind of happened for around the same time. So it's for so a reason, though, man. Wein, Weintraub has been waiting at the top of the Sphinx for hours now, right after he handed his baby to the Shrike, and just is she going to come back? What's going to happen? Big sacrifice. It's only a few hours. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Wow, this was, this was like a lot of philosophy came out in this scene. But no, you're right. Mr. Keats, Mr. Severn, right? He was in, he was on old Earth, uh, the real old Earth, which is still alive, when the when the techno core was basically sealed off and the Farcasters were all blown. Okay, but he has found that he can move throughout the metasphere. And I want to say right before the Farcasters were blown, he shot himself to Hyperion. And so he was able to move in the metasphere around Hyperion. And he went to the Sphinx, uh, and, and apparently the time tombs, the, the, what I got was they could they could reach into the metasphere because he could see the time tombs. Everything else was kind of a black blob in the metasphere, but the time tombs glowed brightly, and he was drawn to them. And he went to the time tombs, and he could see the Shrike taking baby Rachel, and this is a very important part, taking baby Rachel and, and moving through some kind of time portal to some distant future. And the book described it as some terrible, awful, distant future. And we finally find out why Hetmastine had brought that erg with him, right? The erg that could... <sighs> the erg was supposed to drive the Tree of Thorns throughout time and space, but he unleashed the erg, and it allowed him to go... He allowed, it allowed him to take on the form of the erg, because right now Keats has no body. I mean, Joseph Severn died. The body died of tuberculosis of consumption. So he takes on the form of the erg, he goes up to the Shrike, he snatches baby Rachel out of the Shrike's hands, and there's a great uh -huh. scene where he he braces himself and stays where he's at, moving through time. He kind of stops moving, and the Shrike is just being sucked away through the time portal, uh, or, or down the time tunnel, I should say, and there's nothing he can do. And he sits there, and we wait until... Until he's like, okay, I don't have enough energy to move. Maybe someone will come along. I'm like, seriously? Who's going to come along? I didn't see this coming, John. You were ahead of me. But Rachel comes out, grabs the baby, and Rachel is carrying Rachel. Very mind-blowing. And he, she comes out of the time tombs with her... Adult younger, Rachel. Carrying younger, little Rachel. Yeah, baby Rachel and big Rachel. Little Rachel. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. And Saul's like, my babies, my babies, my two girls. And everybody's there. And the thing, okay, doesn't stop there. You're like, oh, cool, Rachel's alive. Thank goodness. I mean, really, it's like, was she? Was was this going to be like, you know, Rachel? It just grows older again. But no, Braun comes up with Martin Salinas because she saved him. We we didn't we forgot to mention Braun uh, and her bad bad self. <clears throat> she uh, she fought the strike and she uh, shattered him because he turned to glass. That was. That Those was never explained. I, I have no comment on that because I don't know how she did that or why. She's uh, Neo. Other than uh, she's right, the mother she's, of Neo. She's Neo, right? She's uh, the mother of Neo. Other than Anybody, the human god intervened once again, possibly. It, it gets kind of it gets kind of crazy then, but go watch Matrix. Who don't know who Neo is? <laughs> but Braun Lamy is Carry Martin Slinnis in a fireman's carry, which is just funny. I mean, just worth you know worth the price of admission by itself. And Martin Slinnis looks and says, is that Rachel? And then, Monita, I mean, and basically, no, Braun says, it's Monita. And you're like, what? Kassad's girlfriend is Rachel? So 
I still haven't wrapped my head around that one. I was still no, no, like, I, I have, wow. and I'm going to explain it to you right now, okay? <laughs> She's come from the future, and you're saying, how does Rachel get to the future? Because she had Merlin sickness. She was hit with those incredible time ties, and she started aging backwards. Well, here's what it is right here. She mentions I had to get approval from the Paradox Board just to have this meeting because I'm carrying myself, right? I'm in two places at once. What happens is Weintraub, Saul Weintraub, is given the opportunity to take baby Rachel. He's lost everything he has. At this. He has no wife. He really has no home anymore. He's given the opportunity to move forward in time and see this distant future. Right where Kassad fought the Shrike. And so he takes baby Rachel into the future, and baby Rachel was raised in the future, and then in the future she was chosen to go back in time with the Shrike. So it all made sense to me. And, and the fact that she got Merlin's sickness, she was chosen in the first book, Hyperion, to get Merlin's sickness and age backwards because she was going to be raised a second time, but in a far distant future. In a far distant future, that way, as an adult, she could see why she needed to escort the Shrike back in time. And, and the concept was so awesome, and I had to read it over a couple of times, and I had to hit rewind a couple of times on my audiobook, right? Just uh, trying to wrap my. But once I wrapped my head around it, I said, "This is so brilliant." And then I said to myself, "Who are you, Dan Simmons? <laughs> are you from the future?" He is from the future, oh, yeah. and I really still don't. I get it. Trust me, it was easy to understand. It's brilliant. It's all it's brilliant. Tell Hey, send us a postcard from the future. That's awesome. I want to go. But I still didn't kind of get, like, that's Kassad's girlfriend. So, anyway, that was awesome. And uh, there goes Saul. You, you, you wrapped it up there. You're kind of like, wow. Her uh, keeper, or the Shrike's keeper, was Saul's kid the whole time, Kassad's girlfriend the whole time. I'm like, wow, man. Where do you go from here? And where you go from here is they say goodbye to Saul. They kind of uh, wrap it up, and uh, the world readjust. You know, it's kind of like all these characters readjust to no forecasters. The world is different. Um, the console uh, is about to leave months later. We fast forward to the epilogue. That's the end. Um, that really is the end. And But you, you get a sense of like, well, what's happening with, you know, the gods in the future with the war? And there's still that big piece uh, that the Shrike is still out there. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to take a look at it as you know, setting us up for the next two books. But Bron Lamy goes to a big send-off with the console. I love how you know the Alsters interacting with everybody. Bron Lamia, you know, she's you know she's seven months pregnant, but she uh, she she she's kind of bittersweet because everybody got to see Severn. Different people got to actually meet Severn after Johnny died. She she still has this longing for her her one true love, and she gets to meet up with him because after the party, Severn shows up, but he's a hologram. But he's in the uh, data sphere, metasphere, megasphere. He's somewhere. Yeah, he went all Obi Wan Kenobi on us. All Obi Wan Kenobi on us. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did Star Wars get here? So she uh, ba basically, <laughs> she she's basically like Johnny. What what do I do? What how, you can't survive. He's like I won't be here. But you're you're, you know I'm the one who comes before, and you will be the one who you will you carry our child. Or I'm the uncle, and obviously. Yeah, sorry, don't, I won't go there. But basically, your child is the one who teaches. Your yours will be the one that will bring forth, you know, this humanity, this process of humanity, where we aren't slaves and we um, actually. Go out and, and it's a girl. <laughs> it is a girl. Why? It's oh man, you weren't supposed to tell the sex of the baby. No, that was interesting. It was a girl, and so Johnny, but Johnny or Severn, whatever, in man, yeah, he's him, like, whatever. He's like, well, I won't be here, and she's like, no, and then you're, uh, she's like, I have a great idea, because I'm like Neo's mom, and she basically says, just hide in the console ship. I love it, because at the very, if you remember the very beginning of Hyperion, we we see the console on his ship hunting on this world. You know, he's like a, he's like this outdoors man on this really cool ship playing the piano, having like a you know like a mini mansion to himself. But anyway, Bronze's idea is to have. Uh, Johnny Keats' uh, memory stored inside the ship, which is a powerful ship that can store, you know, his full AI. And you're like, all right, he survives. He also spits out poetry on the ship now. So it's pretty. He drove the console mad. Yeah, he was pretty. It's a great <laughs> ending. It's, it's a great ending. And he darts off into outer space. And Bron Lamy, you realize, will be the mother 
you know, I was worried that she'd, she'd give birth to the Antichrist way long ago when we didn't know what the strike was, but she's going to give birth to um, the one who teaches, the one who can uh, help set humanity on the right course, separate from the Technocore and fighting the ultimate intelli intelligence that the robots create in the future. So you're like, wow, our characters and, are awesome. Yeah, once again, I, I firmly believe Dan Simmons meant for, you know, the one who teaches all that stuff by design from the human ultimate intelligence, the the, the triune god, right? Um, that god's plan taking effect. Um, because, again, I, I've said it three times now, you only got the Technocore UI's perspective in this story. So I think it added such a great dynamic that it, it's, just, it's what made it feel real. It's what made you... It's what made you continue to have that sense of mystery about the story. It's like, wow, that miraculous thing happened. I wonder how that worked out. And you're like, well, you don't forget about this whole other ultimate intelligence over over here. And I have to make a couple comments here. I pictured the Technocore ultimate intelligence the whole time as basically just V'ger. It was V'ger going through outer space feeding on quasars. <laughs> and um, Star Trek, yeah. Absolutely. i got to bring it all into play here. Uh, and I have, I have a couple more comments. Braun Lamia, both the first name and last name have significant meaning uh, in that the name of John, and this is, I'm talking about the real John Keats, John Keats Fanny, his true love Fanny, her name was Fanny Braun, and uh, Lamia is the name of a poem written by Keats. No kidding. So Braun Lamia. Also, Silenus is another name that's rooted in literature. Um, it's Greek mythology, but there was something, and I, I barely did any reading on this, but uh, there's something about the wisdom of Silenus. Um, if you go back and look at it, you probably find it on Wikipedia, which is what I glanced at before uh, before we did the show here. And I wish I had known this earlier. Did you did you feel like um, like like you had seen elements of this story before? Because because I did, and I kept thinking, what have I seen? That felt even close to being this epic, but Still really man. good. What? Battlestar Galactica, the new Battlestar Galactica, Battle had a Star. lot of this stuff about God, uh, cybrids, um, machines, wanting oh, an ultimate right. intelligence. All those, all those elements are in the battle, and it, it makes me want to watch the whole series again, and I probably will. But that, that, that's the closest thing that we have on film to to what this book was able to accomplish. I mean, the depth in this book was amazing, and I am a fanboy, and I'll tell you right up front, and I'd never read this before, but this is this is literature, this is modern literature, happens to be set in a sci-fi setting, and I'm also proud to say it is sci-fi, right? It's true sci-fi, and, and it really puts, to me, it's been out for a while, but it puts sci-fi on the map. We, we are true literature, right? We are fans of true literature. You can be fans of true sci-fi. And uh, I loved everything about this book. What, you know, what, I think what it you wrapped up book? a lot more satisfactorily than Battlestar Galactica. You just... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot yeah. believe oh, yeah. that this looks just like Battlestar Galactica. There's no strike, but there's those crazy Cylons that are scary. And so they're close to the strike. But seriously, with the whole concepts to God and, and um, whose God do you worship, is it the... Is it, you know... Uh, the one or the gods or the one god. There's a lot of mythology that that does overlap. I won't. Pour, we're not talking about Battlestar Galactica, but you just blew me away because those parallels are right there. So, John, wrap it up. What is your verdict? It's six out of five stars. I don't care what you say, but what is? Tell me what you uh, think. Yeah. Hyperion is to you. Just tell me about what you, how you felt, man. How you felt. Uh, Hi Hyperion. Um. <sighs> Best book I've ever read, and I, I'm saying that out of every every book I've ever read because I've never read anything that 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 had this uh, uh, level of depth and really delving into philosophy. But this book opened me up again to considering uh, free will. Um, what is free will? Because Dan Simmons brings all that up in this book without actually making a conclusion on what free will is, and it provided me a perspective on on uh, what we would think of is the real God um, in a way that no other book ever has. So that's what it means to me. It, it was a time of reflection, reading The Fall of Hyperion. Uh, Hyperion, the first book, was was excellent, and it was a mystery, and it was well-written. Fall of Hyperion made me reflect on a lot of things uh, throughout the years that I've been in existence. That's what it meant to me. Best, best book, best story I've ever read. 
I think you summed it up there. It makes you think about, you know, your, your beliefs, you know, what, what is the meaning of life? You can't answer it. Dan Simmons doesn't try to say, okay, look, in the future, the robots answer the question. And here, we gave you an awesome tale that actually concluded, you know, uh, generations of humans and what people have, you know, try to figure out their whole lives. No, he doesn't do that at all. He sits here and gives you a complex story with so many layers, so many believable layers of a future that is interesting, that is unique. It does borrow other concepts. You know, it has, it has you know, flavors of, of the Matrix, of Terminator, of, you know, the creator versus the created relationships between those two those two things, and so you you really do get this sense that there's 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 ways to look at life, and he he shows that through many different viewpoints, and uh, he he talks about in the end even love is the most important thing, you know Saul had to identify that love was the only thing that was going to make him, I mean that was the only thing that was really meaningful at the end, um, and love is what binds this human conscious or this human made God, so. It's nothing that science can decipher or define. It's, it's, it's that faith. It's going out on faith. and But it doesn't put that in your face. It makes you decide, hey, this is how these people have decided to live their life. This is you know, this is basically the decisions they made, and, and they're willing to live with those repercussions. All the characters were willing to live with the consequences of their choices, and they were real people. And so best story ever, one of them, best science fiction story I've ever read, yes. So I think... The last two books, can they top it? I don't know. But as for this story, I'm never going to forget any of these characters for a long time. The word Farcaster will never leave my lexicon. Farcaster is a good and bad thing in my lexicon. So I, I definitely uh, will hold these characters in my heart for a very long time. And I, t I you know, man, I mean, I'm going to admit it. Some of these things just hit me hard because, you know, you could relate at all different levels. These people represented, you know, humanity and all its um, plurality. So that was the cool thing. He uh, he took seven happened to them. So Hyperion, love you. I heart you. Fall of Hyperion. Thanks for wrapping it up. And John, six out of... Five stars, seven out of five stars. Six, six out of five. And look, I, I mean it. I have read a lot of books, and I've read a lot of classics, okay? And I have my favorite classical authors. This this is unlike anything I've ever read. Dan Simmons really accomplished something with this story. But, hey, before we go, we got to tell the listeners what we have coming up. And uh, we have we have an in-between book that I'm going to let Josh tell you about, the in-between book for next week. But after we, after we get through next the next week's podcast we're going to begin another epic series uh the next big series we're beginning is going to be robert jordan's wheel of time series we are starting with the eye of the world want to go ahead and throw out we don't intend to do all 12 books for the entire next year we're going to hit one we'll move on to some other stuff we'll eventually come back to book two we will get through that series it's going to be you know a three-year plan probably but uh we're going to start with eye of the world um not next week, but the week after. But so for our in between, our our, our easy book, Josh. <laughs> easy. There's nothing easy. We are going back to the original, the man himself that could take on any beastie, any bad boy, any mythological sorceress, any sorcerer, anybody, any shaman, anything, anywhere. We are hitting Conan the Barbarian. That's right, Conan the Man. So Conan the Barbarian, bunch of short stories. We will pick three. We'll put that on the podcast for you. So you can read with us, submit your questions on the Rain of Books podcast uh, at rainofbooks.com, or you can go to the Goodreads thread. So give us your questions. Vote your favorite barbarian stories from Conan because he is fun. No matter which way you slice it, the man gets into it, and he can get out of it. So I'm looking forward to it. And after the fall of Hyperion, I'm uh, you know getting near meaning to the you know the meaning of life. I'm looking to just go for some good slash and hack action. Conan's going to bring it. Wheel of Time series the week after that. I am glad we're going to start that. That's on the life reading list, and uh, that's going to be good. It's going to be epic. Thanks to everybody for joining us. This has been the Rain of Books. We'll catch you next time, next yeah. week, same place. Yeah, have a great week. See ya.